Hello, and welcome to Ocean Witness. I'm Simon Watt. And I'm Sophie Duker. And it's time to grab your mask, snorkel and flippers, because this week is all about... Coral. coral. feel about Coral, Sophie? I went to school with a girl called Coral. Yeah? Yeah, her grades were below sea level. Coming up on today's show, we'll visit an ecological disaster in Mauritius, we'll dive to the depths of the Amazon reef, and we'll meet the director of the hit film, My Octopus Teacher. But first, what exactly is Coral? This handy explainer will reveal all. And now we are joined from the Maldives by conservationist Shaha Hashim. Hi. Hi, Shaha. Hello. Shaha, you've been spending so much of your life underwater. What's it like being on the reefs of the Maldives? They are magical places. There are so many different types of um, marine life in a coral reef ecosystem. So if you go snorkeling or dive in there, you don't know where to look because there are so many different life in different colors, shapes, and designs. And you, ne you never get tired of observing them and learning more about them. You've mentioned so many different types of life coexisting on the reef. What do you think is your favorite species that, that a coral reef is home to? I love groupers. They are uh, very grumpy looking, but um, <laughs> they play a really important role on the sea. They can change colors. They can aggregate in large numbers. Um, and they can fight with each other. Coral reefs are not that common in terms of the wide oceans. So why are they so important? They cover um, less than 1% of the ocean, but they harbor more than 25% of the marine life. So these are really powerhouses um, that um, host so much biodiversity and provide um, so much food for the people all across the globe. 
What's the situation globally? How are coral reefs doing across the world? Coral reefs have existed for more than 100 million years. But over the last 25 years, the world's coral reefs have been on a downward spiral. We have lost about 15 to 20 percent of the world's um, coral reefs. They are one of the most threatened ecosystems in the world. Is there anything that we can do to reverse this process? Or at least is there stuff that we can do to protect coral reefs better? The best thing, obviously, is to reduce the greenhouse gas emissions. Um, small countries like us, uh, we can't do much because we really depend on the commitments from other big countries. So the only way to save coral reefs is realistically to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. If we continue um, at the current trend, um, it's uh, predicted that coral reefs wouldn't exist by the end of the century. This is really bad news for us because uh, we wouldn't have a home to live and uh, we'll eventually be climate refugees if we can't uh, prevent this. But I think um, more and more people are aware of the threats to coral reefs and how important it is to uh, save them. So I think there's hope. Um, it's not too late to save the coral reefs, but we have a very small window of opportunity. Thank you so much, Shaha. That was brilliant. Yeah, keep up the good work. Thank you. From the Maldives to Mauritius now, where a coral reef has fallen victim to a man-made disaster. On the 25th of July this year, the Wakashio, a bulk carrier, ran aground on the Pointe des Nies coral reef. What followed was the worst oil spill in the country's history, as around 1,000 tonnes of fuel leaked into the water. In the aftermath of the disaster, we've heard reports of some 50 whales and dolphins washing up dead on local shores. We can now speak to someone who has seen this ongoing disaster firsthand. Fridays for Future activist Shama Sandia. Shama, witnessing this, how did it feel to see that? We were seeing the oil coming out from the ship and coming into a lagoon and reaching our coastline. And to be able to smell it also, because we, we can't forget that um, heavy oil is very toxic and it has a strong smell. So um, just to visualize it and to smell it, it was really depressing for us. And the other picture is that we saw Mauritians coming together. So that was a nice one because um, we've been going through a lot during these last years and to see everyone come together in solidarity to try and help the coastline, that was really beautiful. What sort of actions did people take to try and solve this problem? So we've been having uh, people from the local village and actually from everywhere around Mauritius that came together just to try and make those artisanal booms with just straws, uh, sugarcane straws and uh, some nets so that the fishers and the skippers, they could go out at sea and place those, um, those booms to prevent the oil from reaching the coastline. So um, it was really amazing and um, seeing this wave of solidarity among the merchants and to see that some people even cut their hair to be used in the in the booms it was really wonderful can you give us an idea of why this reef is so important and what it was like before the oil spill happened during the recent decades we've been losing our corals by a lot we don't have the same number of fish before as before we don't have the same number of corals corals are bleaching or dying it's causing a bit of a problem so um, that region is actually, it's one of our remaining biodiversity hotspots in Mauritius. They help the fishers to get their food every day. They help the fishers to gain their livelihood every day. We also have diving centers in that area, which allow people to discover the marine ecosystems. That's why maybe um, all Mauritians felt like a heartbreak when they saw the Wakasha leaking oil. It was really heartbreaking and um, Personally, it hit me a lot because we've been fighting for a few years now about the environment, about the need to protect the marine ecosystems, about the need to protect the coral reefs, to protect the lagoons, and um, how we are already being impacted by the, by the climate crisis. So um, that was a huge slap in the face. That was a message that uh, the system is not okay because, like I said so many times, that ship comes from... Um, from Asia and uh, the oil has been extracted from somewhere else from the planet and it's coming here and destroying 
our ecosystems. It's not fair that our fishermen right now, our skippers, our diving centers are suffering or paying the price for that. They're losing their jobs, they're losing, they're losing their livelihoods, their food. That is not okay. It's discriminating the people who, who are um, living on the oceans. It's discriminating people who need nature. And that is not okay. I agree with you, Shama. It is heartbreaking and unfair that this has happened. But how can we stop it from ever happening again? What steps can we take to make sure that oil spills don't destroy communities and sources of life? We just have to keep the oil in the ground where it belongs. Because honestly, um, the, first, the, the whole process of extracting the oil is already dangerous. We've had the Deepwater Horizon to show us clearly how dangerous that is. So that is one thing. The second thing is that when we're using the oil, not only are we contributing to the greenhouse gases, but um, we're also putting toxic substances in the air, in our water, in our food, on our lands. So that is not okay. We absolutely need to stop this thing about oil. Thanks for talking to us, Shama. I hope that Mauritius continues to recover. Yes, thank you so much for sharing your story and I hope it inspires people to take action against these things happening again. Thank you very much. That's really nice to see how you're trying to, to push our story further because um, people in the Indian Ocean, they are not being heard enough. So thank you very much for that. Now, oil spills aren't the only threat to coral reefs. Climate change is a largely invisible but widespread threat and warming waters can have devastating effects. Now we're heading to the Mediterranean Sea, where a team from Greenpeace Italy spent the summer investigating the health of the sea and its unique coral habitats. Sadly, they made some really shocking discoveries. Siamo qui all'isola d'Elba per il progetto Mare Caldo. Proprio qui abbiamo installato la nostra prima stazione pilota per misurare la variazione delle temperature del mare fino ai 40 metri. Tre pareti verticali, una che va a terra e una che va fuori, che è qua. E in questi giorni ci stiamo immergendo con i ricercatori dell'Università di Genova, del DISTAV, per andare a vedere come la variazione della temperatura sta avendo un impatto su quella che è la flora e la fauna marina. Oggi abbiamo fatto delle belle immersioni in quest'area che su siti normalmente frequentati anche dal turismo subacqueo. Abbiamo visto tanta vita, tanta, tanti organismi, sono siti molto molto ricchi. Non possiamo negare che il fondale oggi è completamente ricoperto da uno strato uniforme di mucillagine. Mucillagine che sta coprendo tutti gli organismi, quindi probabilmente verso la fine dell'estate tenderà a scendere, andando a coprire anche le, le gorgogne, che sono queste belle foreste, questa attrattiva di subacqueo e questo patrimonio naturale che abbiamo nel nostro, nel nostro mare. Operativa Buongiorno, Diving Careno, chiamata per accesso a figlio di Pianosa. Siamo appena arrivati a Pianosa, eh, un'area di mare completamente protetta. E siamo molto emozionati perché siamo qui per capire come sta il mare, soprattutto dopo questo lockdown e non sappiamo davvero cosa aspettarci. Un'immersione davvero incredibile, bellissimo vedere un mare così. Una vita spettacolare, tantissimo pesce, eh, tantissime gorgonie sane in salute, veramente meraviglioso. Abbiamo visto come delle zone totalmente protette, come dove ci siamo immersi a, a Pianosa, dimostrano come la natura riesce a reagire meglio al cambiamento in atto. Si è visto che laddove il mare è protetto e quindi non vi è l'impatto dell'uomo, le specie sono in grado di reagire e resistere meglio ad un cambiamento che è già in atto.
it's such an alien place and sad to see it changing in the ways that we would not want. Well, to learn more about this, we're now joined by Georgia Monty from Greenpeace Italy. Hi, Georgia. Thanks hi, for coming. Georgia. Hello. Hi. How are you? Okay. Good. One of the things that you mentioned in the video was the Gorgonian. Uh, I've never heard of those before. Are they rare? Yeah, Gorgonian are like the Mediterranean corals. So probably people well known the tropical uh, coral reef and don't know that in the Med too we have a, a coral world. And one iconic species of this world is really Gorgonian. And in general, they are animals that live in colonies and they live together on a skeleton that create these erect uh, construction. They're really kind of an engineer species because they create this huge uh, fan and uh, they create all together uh, an underwater forest. At the same time, they're really super sensitive. Actually, they are a bioindicator for the study that we're doing on the impact of climate change at sea because they're really, really sensitive to the impact of human activities and especially to uh, the warming up of water temperature. What you just described there is obviously very, very beautiful and all the colours and everything. But as we can see, those colours are being really dulled by this slime. Can you take us through what's happening here? When I was diving, it looked like kind of a spectral environment somehow in some areas, because all these Gorgonians were covered by, as you call, the slime. Actually, is a, what the scientists say is mucilage, sometimes filamentous of sea algae, and the problem is that this mucilage kind of suffocates all the organisms that are under it. And think of the Gorgonian, they are animals that stay anchored to the substrate. So they depend really on the current to get all their nutrients and to get uh, the oxygen. And if they are covered by this line for a long period, they suffocate and they start to die. Scientists say that one of the causes of this mucilage is really the increasing temperature of our seas. You painted a very grim picture there. What can be done? Well, uh, uh, we can do a lot. If we think of climate change, what we need to do is, of course, an action at global level and, and cut the mission. But on the other side, at sea, we can do a lot. What we've seen in our diving and probably have seen through the images that when we go to protected area, when we go to area where any other kind of any kind of human activities are, are blocked, the, the environment, the, our sea, the animals are able to, to, to react and to adapt to the change that now we have. So to increase resilience of our habitat, we need to increase the network of protected area. We have to create a network of sanctuary. Thanks so much, Georgia. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to you. Bye. So there's coral you can enjoy while paddling around with your snorkel, and there's coral that is best visited in a submarine. The Amazon reef is just off the coast of Brazil, and part of it lies over 200 metres below the surface. No human had ever been down there until 2017, when a Greenpeace team got in a submarine and went exploring. I'm here aboard the Greenpeace ship Esperanza to explore the Amazon reef for the first time. It's really exciting, but it's also important because we know so little about our ocean in general and about this area in particular. First, every morning very early we start with the pre-dive checks and we go through to make sure that everything is working. And then we test the seal of the domes, the pressure, the oxygen levels, the battery power, all of these things, and we're ready to go. The crew has been standing by, they have a rescue boat in the water, they attach us to the crane, put us over the side and away we go. Once we reach about 20 meters, we communicate to the team on the surface and confirm that our life support readings are okay. Then we are approved to continue down to the bottom. We turn on our lights because the deeper we go, the less sunlight that makes it through the water. Sometimes we land and there's a beautiful wall with sponges and corals and lots of fish. And other times it looks almost like a desert. And that's one of the exciting things about exploring. You never, you never really know what you're going to find. Once we're on the bottom, the ship gives us a heading. That's the direction to take. And we are gathering data mostly with the video camera. The video is the data. And we carry on like that for as much as two hours. And every 15 minutes we are communicating back to the ship because they want to make sure that our life support is still in good shape. 
So, as we're coming back up to the surface, we're seeing more and more light. The water is getting bluer and bluer. They come with a rescue boat, and we open up the domes and are very happy to have some fresh air. What an incredible experience. Yeah, and really lucky, getting to be a real pioneer. It's like space travel, but on our own planet, I guess. Yeah, when you come up to the surface, it is literally a whole new world. And now we are going to be speaking to John Hosevar, an incredible Greenpeace campaigner and submarine pilot. Here he is now. Hi, John. Hi, John. Hello there. I wanted to ask you, first of all, what was it like being down there? One of the amazing things about uh, operating a submarine is that pretty much any time you drop down into the ocean, you're seeing something that no one has ever seen before. You're visiting places that no one has ever been. And so you don't know what you're going to find. We've discovered new species. We've learned completely new things about how these species interact. And it's just, uh, it's always fascinating. What is the difference between deep sea coral and other types of coral? The main difference is that deep sea corals live below where sunlight can penetrate. So they don't have the algae, the symbiotic algae in their tissues like tropical corals. They grow usually slower. They don't form the large reefs like you see, uh, you know, in tropical areas like the Great Barrier Reef, for example. And I guess that must mean that if we don't protect areas where the, the deep sea corals live, their chances of recovery are greatly diminished. That's right. One coral can live hundreds, some of them even over a thousand years. So you can imagine how long it would take an area to recover if the corals were damaged or destroyed. With the Amazon reef, in the beginning, the biggest threat was from oil and gas drilling. There were companies from all over the world that wanted to drill right by the Amazon reef, which could have been devastating. Increasingly, we are seeing threats from industrial fishing, bottom trawling, and long lying. And then now the emerging threat is deep sea mining. And we are starting to see large companies looking to exploit the bottom of the ocean, areas which have been largely uh, protected from humans up until now. The first thing that we need to do is create a global network of sanctuaries. This is the best tool that we have to protect biodiversity, to rebuild depleted populations, and to help give our oceans and ecosystems a fighting chance to deal with climate change. We need a strong global ocean treaty to help us create this network, to scale up sanctuaries for the first time. So you are a submarine pilot. How does one go about becoming that? Is the training particularly specific or arduous? How long did it take you to be where you are today? It's funny, it isn't that complicated to actually pilot a submarine. If you can drive a car, you could probably figure out how to drive a submarine. Because it's a lot like a flying car that you steer with your feet. Um, the thing that takes a little bit more training is to help figure out what to do when something goes wrong. Some of it, if it's wrong enough, it's beyond your control, but there's a lot that you can catch early and get yourself out of trouble before it becomes serious. Thank you, John. Thank you so much, John. My pleasure. From someone searching the depths, we go to someone who is scaling the heights. On this week's Life on Board, we're joining climber Victoria Henry as an activist, she's climbed right to the top of the Shard, the UK's tallest building. And you might remember her from our previous video, taking action against a super trawler. Sophie, why are you wearing that hat? I'm here to make a safety announcement. Victoria is a trained climber. And just like anyone that climbs the Greenpeace, she does planning and training to ensure the safety of everyone involved. In other words, if you were thinking about scaling the side of a ship, don't. My name is Victoria Henry and I am from Canada. For a lot of us who are used to only doing rock climbing and only doing climbing on buildings, the first couple times that we as climbers do climbing actions at sea, it's really overwhelming and it definitely feels really stressful. Climbing at sea is really interesting because um, Many people see climbing as only getting more dangerous as the height increases. It's not at all. I might be climbing on something quite short, but without the same kind of protections, and all of a sudden it becomes really dangerous. And with the oceans and all the stuff that we do at sea with boats, it is the most dangerous type of climbing that we do. Uh, 
Getting into the boat and then like driving really fast, it always feels, it's really, really hard to kind of keep the adrenaline down and remain calm and focused on the thing that I am doing. The thing that can be the hardest is getting onto the ship. So we use a really long extendable pole with like a hook in the end that detaches from the pole. On the hook is a big rope. And from a moving boat, they need to come alongside and whilst in motion, come alongside that larger boat. Believe it or not, falling in the water is like a good case scenario, right? That's why we tend to only climb on a single line um, and boats that will drop you off to get onto something will be moving out of the way. It does happen that people try to cut ropes, people try to push hooks off, um, and that can be really dangerous for us. It's something that we know can happen. People have been trying for so long to get through to these companies. People have been asking to meet with them, trying to get our politicians to take action. What I'm hoping to do here is to, again, escalate that and to make our voices really heard. Super trawlers and overfishing has been a big political pawn, but nothing's ever changing. And so what we hope to achieve is to move it along and to make people realize how important it is to actually do something about it. And I never think to myself that I'm gonna be doing the thing that's gonna like win the campaign, right? I'm realistic about it. So for me, what I'm hoping to accomplish is just add pressure. We're adding something that people can't ignore. That's some extreme climbing. Yeah. I want to see how the video ends, actually, how she got down from there <laughs> afterwards. And now it's time to meet our Creature of the Week. This week's creature is the octopus. And if you haven't heard about the hit documentary, My Octopus Teacher, which bit of coral have you been hiding under? Joining us from South Africa is the film's co-director, Pippa Ehrlich. Hi, Pippa. Hey, Pippa. Congrats on the film. Thanks very, very much. Uh, we've, we've been thoroughly blown away by the responses we've been getting. But this means you have spent so much longer with an octopus than so many of us. So what kind of behaviours and things did you observe? What are we all missing? I mean, I think what's pretty extraordinary about octopuses is, and we say in the beginning of our film that a lot of people say an octopus is like an alien. And if you look at it in terms of evolutionary biology, about 400 million years ago, octopuses and human beings were a similar kind of thing. They were both a sort of worm. And then we diverged on the two major paths that you can take in evolution. And we became vertebrates, and we are supposedly one of the most neurologically complex vertebrates. And octopuses became probably the most neurologically complex invertebrate. So, we couldn't be further away from each other as far as the evolutionary tree is concerned, but somehow we can relate to these incredibly strange creatures that have a completely different uh, brain model to us, a completely different appearance to us, a completely different lifestyle and habitat to us. So to get into the world of an octopus, what does an octopus need to be happy to thrive? Well, I mean, the first thing an octopus needs is a safe place to live. They need a kind of habitat and structure where they can build dens and live safely. Um, and when they're little, they, they make little nests inside sand. And then as they get older, they start to excavate under rocks and hide under there. So there are many, many different species of octopuses. You find them all over the world. Um, some of them live in very, very deep water and have only been recorded on submarines. Some of them live in shallow water coral ecosystems. Um, some live in kelp forests. So they're highly, highly adaptable creatures. Uh, the next thing they need is obviously enough food. And kelp forests are incredibly rich, productive environments. So, And the last thing that an octopus needs is to be entertained. Because they are such clever creatures, they need to have ways of kind of keeping themselves busy. One of the things that we did during the making of the film was we flew out Professor Jennifer Mather, who's an octopus psychologist. So she's, she studies psychology, but she's also an octopus expert. She's based in Canada. 
And the first thing she said to us is, if you want to understand an octopus, you have to understand that their whole life is about the conflict between curiosity and fear. And because of that, they are these learning machines. This octopus lived in a kelp forest, and you've got a particular love for them. Why? Well, the Great African Sea Forest is one of the most unusual and exquisite habitats on Earth. And we've seen massive declines of kelp forests all over the world. And it's very, very important that we protect these ecosystems because they are being proven more and more to be absolutely critical for carbon sequestration. And they're also home to an incredible community of species. And finally, perhaps the obvious question, what did the octopus teach you? <laughs> I think the, octop the, the octopus taught me a few things, but I think the biggest thing is to understand that this creature who is so different from us, um, like every other creature on earth, has a truly fascinating life filled with drama and excitement um, and a desire to, to see that life to its conclusion. And I think that it's very important to think about that when we think about how we relate to every single living creature on our planet. Thank you so Thank much, you. Pippa. Thanks, Pippa. Bye. Thanks, guys. Bye-bye. Now that's all for this week. And do not forget that we need to put pressure on governments around the world to agree to a strong global ocean treaty at the UN. Check out the links below or above this video to find out how you can get involved. And we will leave you with more of the incredible images that John brought back from the Amazon Reef. Relax, enjoy, and we'll see you next time. Bye. Bye.